Brent Scowcroft's observation, if he withdraws with his force intact or most of his forces, we've lost. Well, as we're going to find out, the only force that was really capable and mattered was the Republican Guard Corps. That was it. The rest of these people were forced into action at gunpoint in many cases. Unhappy conscripts who didn't want to be there anyway. And then finally, there's this statement about General Franks, which is not terribly flattering, but was widely known. Franks wasn't going to do anything. I knew General Franks, terribly nice guy. He reminded me of my great-grandfather. <laughs> Iraqi tank crews can fire every eight to 10 seconds from a static defensive position, but are unable to hit targets beyond 500 meters and nothing that moves. That was in an Armour Magazine article written by a retired Lieutenant Colonel from the Israeli Defense Force. We took that and we believed in it because everything coming down to us was, today, Saddam Hussein moved another 16 divisions into the Kuwaiti theater of operations. Today, 500 more T-72 tanks were delivered. Today, come on, come on. You'd thought this guy was Joseph Stalin, the worst development <laughs> king of all time. It was nonsense. But no one would step back and look at reality. Next slide. So what does it boil down to? George Bush said, we have very specific aims. We want to expel the Iraqi forces from Kuwait. We want to eliminate the puppet government set up by the Iraqis in Kuwait. We want to restore and preserve stability in the Gulf, and we want to protect American citizens. That's what he said. This is what General Norman Schwarzkopf says in November 1990 to his generals assembled, the people who would fight the war. Pin the Iraqi Republican Guard with their backs against the sea, then go in and wipe them out. Once they're gone, be prepared to continue the attack to Baghdad. Wow. That's a hell of a statement. I would think Schwarzkopf was right. I don't know who told him to do that. I don't know where that came from. I really don't. But he had identified the only force that mattered politically, because robbing Iraq of that force left Saddam Hussein vulnerable to expulsion from power. And it was translated subsequently into the operations order, which is published on 17 January 1991, destroy Republican Guard forces in the Kuwaiti theater. Got it. Next slide. Now, you've seen some pictures of the desert. Before I go any further, you've got to understand something. The desert is flat. <laughs> there are no rivers. There are no mountains. There are almost no obstacles. There are some areas with volcanic rock. There are some areas that on occasion can be sort of quicksand-like, but they're very small. And the area that we sweep across is actually more gravel than sand. It is exactly the same distance from here to the south of Basra as it is from Washington, D.C. to Philadelphia. But if you had to go from D.C. to Philadelphia with an army, that would be enormously difficult. Not here. So if you got into your you know, Land Rover, uh, Jeep Cherokee, how soon could you be up south of Basra from Saudi Arabia? Six, seven hours? Eight hours? That's about it. That's not what happened. Next slide. This is a picture of the 2nd Cavalry, or the 2nd Armored Cavalry Regiment zone of attack, where we were sent advance. And the 2nd Cavalry was placed in the lead position for the entire 7th Corps. The 110,000 man 7th Corps from Germany was a mobile armored corps. Over a thousand tanks, thousands of Bradleys, over a thousand guns, everything was mounted. Most of the fighting, war fighting equipment was tracked. And this force was brought here to Saudi Arabia for one reason, to conduct this flank attack to go up and annihilate the Republican Guard Corps. Now, the Republican Guard Corps consisted of about 140,000 men total. 20,000 were up in Baghdad. They were like light paramilitary police. Another 20,000 were special ops types, specialized infantry, naval infantry. The rest of it, about 80, maybe a little more, maybe 90,000 armored forces. These are the people with the best equipment Saddam's got. The most modern Soviet equipment that the Soviets would export. They're sitting up there north of Kuwait City, inside Iraq, and that's pretty much where they stayed through most of the campaign. Our job was to make this trip, this 123 miles, up there with the Corps behind us. 
No, it didn't happen. It didn't happen. What happens instead is that we move early into Iraq and we stop after moving perhaps, what, eight kilometers, 10 kilometers, and we halt. There's nothing out there. There's no enemy there. And we stop. And the reason we're stopping is that the next day the Marines are supposed to make their assault, their great attack into the defenses in southern Kuwait, we're supposed to wait for them to make their attack. Okay? So we wait. It was raining, it was cloudy, it was cold, the sky was black from all the uh, oil fires. Our uniforms were covered in oily, nasty soot. So we sat on our vehicles, <laughs> sat on our tanks. John Hillen listened to the radio. I went to sleep. <laughs> and we woke up the next morning. It was a wonderful morning. It was cold, wet, black, nasty, <laughs> overcast. I got into my tank at the center of the formation. John was behind me and his Bradley, and we rolled forward to the lead position. And we had a platoon that was 15, 20 kilometers that raced out in front of us as our forward reconnaissance element. We were spread across 15 kilometers in a 20 kilometer zone, 10 kilometers deep. Got the word to move. It was like Austerlitz at 1805. As I was driving up there, all the troops were up in their turrets waving. Everybody was saying, yeah, let's go! Let's get it done! Let's fight! None of this stuff. Ooh, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. No! Everybody was ready to go, and they were very well trained. So we move. We move from here, about 35, 40 kilometers, up to the next halt point, which we didn't know was going to halt. We, we ended up stopping there. In the meantime, this platoon of six Bradleys and a mortar section of two mortars, two four-deuce mortars, shoots out ahead of us. And on the way up there, an A-10 pilot flies across and tells us that he sees some Iraqi troops up there on this thing called Objective Merrill, where you can see on the left-hand side. And uh, I get this call. Well, the A-10s are in the air. What do you want them to do? I'm in my tank. What do I want them to do? I said, well, can they tell me what's on top of Objective Merrill? Sure. A few minutes later, I said, well, there are a bunch of little guys running around on top of Objective Merrill. We see 12, 14 tanks. We see maybe 20 artillery pieces. Looks like maybe a 1,000 guys down there. So I said, great. Can you drop some bombs on them? <laughs> said, sure. Of course, I'm saying this over the squadron command net. So everybody in the squadron must have been laughing their asses off at me. Because that wasn't exactly this textbook way to ask the Air Force to launch a strike. But I said, can you drop some bombs on them? So there's silence, and then I said, whoa, wait a minute, we have a platoon out there. Can you identify them? And they identified them, said, yep, they're still five, ten kilometers out. I said, good, okay. Don't bomb when they get close. <laughs> Not a problem. Okay. So they identified the platoon, it moves up there. Then they called me up and said, okay, we're out of fuel. We hit them. We think we hit most of the tanks. We think we hit a lot of the artillery, and all the little guys are scattered. I said, great. This lieutenant from Tennessee, I think went to the University of Florida, takes the brigade objective. 1,500 Iraqi troops ultimately end up surrendering. That's because he had to kill a killer cut off. It takes him a total of almost eight hours to take over this objective, take all these prisoners, and we report that we've taken objective Merrill. Good news? Sure. You would think up at the regimental headquarters and say, damn, good job. No. They'd say, pull off of Objective Merrill. We're going to launch an artillery prep on Objective Merrill tomorrow morning. <laughs> pull back behind phase line Dixie. What? And I said to John, didn't you tell these people? We've taken the objective. So John, you know, 